All right, good morning. Welcome to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. So I'm Rob Pennington. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for NCSA. I'm also the Deputy Director. So you're at one of the most interesting places in the country for computing, and we're looking forward to the discussions with you today. So it's my privilege to welcome you to NCSA and tell you that we're very happy that you've joined us here for the Petascale Day. And this is the first annual Petascale Day. I don't know if we'll have another one next year, but it's certainly going to be an interesting process. I, I was just cho joking with somebody about when is the exascale day? This is 10 to the 15th. When are we going to have the 10 to the 18th day? So, so look for that to come. Uh, in computing, petascale refers to a computer system that's capable of reaching performance in excess of one petaflops, like the Blue Water system that's going in at NCSA. So, Blue Waters will have a peak speed of about 11 and a half petaflops. So this is a very significant computing resource. In fact, it'd be probably the biggest open computing resource in the country when it goes online. So a petaflop is one quadrillion, and I always have to look to be able to say that right, but one quadrillion floating point operations per second. That's how fast can you multiply or divide or add or subtract two floating point operations, or two floating point numbers together. So a quadrillion is written as, in scientific notation as 10 to the 15th power. So that's 10 with a 15, and that's why you see the 15 zeros. So that's why today we're ce celebrating National Petascale Day. This is October 15th, 10-15. So the problem is, this is a really, really big number. I know I get lost after about four, and, and that's as far as it goes. But how do you get your hands around what is a quadrillion? So at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to Brett Bodie, who's going to try and give you some idea of how big a quadrillion really is, give you some context, give you some way to relate this number, which is a quadrillion, to the numbers that you're familiar with. So Brett, would you please? All right, thank you, Rob. I'm on? All right, very good. All right, so uh, as Rob said, I'm gonna give you kind of a non-technical overview of what is a quadrillion. Um, since this is petascale day, we're, we're looking at, uh, at 10 to the 15th, and one quadrillion is one times 10 to the 15th. So what does that mean? It's one followed by 15 zeros, or 10 to the 15th in scientific notation. Uh, you can look at it as a million billions or a thousand trillions, um, however you like to think of it. I guess you could think of it as a thousand times our annual national debt <laughs> this year. <laughs> but uh, uh, still a very big number. Um, but how do you wrap your head around it? So it's, it's fairly easy to think of 10 or even 100. Um, thousand's not too bad. But what, what, what do you think of when you think of a million? You can start to think of a fairly large city, like San Jose, California is about a million people. Uh, Chicago's on the order of two million people. Uh, Los Angeles is a bit more than three million. Um, so those are all good-sized cities uh, on the order of a million. Um, what do you start to look at when you think of numbers that get much bigger than that? Um, we're no longer really on the human scale so much. Um, certainly you get to the number of humans on the planet around seven billion. But what, what do you look at when you can actually visualize it? Um, one that relates very well to the Midwest here is one quadrillion kernels of corn um, happens to be roughly 52 million acres worth of production in a year for most of the Midwestern states. So that's most of the Corn Belt. So that represents a good part of the corn grown in the, certainly in the, in the U.S., if not the world, in a, in a year. So that's a, a very big number, and for those of you scientific sticklers in the audience, yes, that has too many significant figures, but I didn't create the slide, so. Uh, it also uh, matches up to be uh, one, one million quad, one quadrillion kernels of wheat would uh, be enough to, to uh, uh, make enough wheat uh, flour to make 42 billion loaves of bread. That's a lot of bread. <laughs> So uh, another, another uh, interesting factoid is uh, 
uh, one quadrillion watts is, a, is roughly equivalent to a thousand lightning strikes. Um, I, I have the note in the slides here from our PR department was that it was, you're supposed to remember it, it took just one lightning strike to power the time machine on the DeLorean and back to the future. Uh, <laughs> so, um, another, way, another way to look at it, um, is this is still hard to grasp, but on a human scale, one quadrillion drops of water, so if you take a, an average size drop, which is about 0.05 milliliters, it's a very small thing, um, it would take one quadrillion of those drops would still fill 20,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So that's, that's a lot of water. Um, how does that compare with blue waters? Um, blue waters will have a, a peak performance on the order of uh, uh, 11 and a half petaflops, um, or 11 and a half quadrillion operations per second. Um, that's a lot of math. You can do a lot with that. Um, how does it compare to what, uh, uh, how long you could do it? So if, if you had a calculator and you could add you know, a floating point number per second, which is very fast for a human, you, it's not so hard to do it when you're talking about one plus one or one plus two, but when you're adding eight to 10 digit numbers, it's a little harder to do one, one per second. Um, but if you could, uh, at, and do that at a continuous rate um, until you got to one quadrillion operations, it, it would take you 31 million years to do that. Um, obviously not something that's very tractable for a, for a human being, or even many human beings. Um, similarly, uh, the storage system on Blue Waters uh, can hold, uh, on a near-line archive system that may, many of you may see the, the beginnings of at uh, NPCF if you take the tour today or this week, um, it, it will eventually be able to hold up to 30 quadrillion bytes of data. Um, so that's th 30 um, petabytes worth of data. That's roughly equivalent to the, the storage content of 80 million DVD movies. So again, a lot of data. Um, what are we going to do with all, all that power? Um, so here's a, a sample movie uh, showing a hurricane simulation. Uh, actually, this was Hurricane Katrina, I believe, as it was approaching uh, the, U the US uh, mainland from the Gulf of Mexico. I'll let this play. Uh, some of our researchers that have already been assigned uh, time on blue waters will model severe weather um, that ranges from small scale phenomena like tornadoes that are very uh, much relevant to, the, to us in the Midwest to larger scale phenomena like hurricanes um, such as this uh, to, uh, to other more global phenomena like climate modeling and that sort of thing. Um, this is a reasonably pretty movie. It's even prettier on my screen than it is on the, on the screen up there. Um, and we can do enough calculations in the past to, to create movies like this. But in order to get real scientific insights, you have to, to do much finer grain calculations, smaller cell sizes, and, and that sort of thing. And that takes a much more powerful computer. Um, oh, let's see here. How long are we going to let this play? So I'll go ahead and let this play through a little bit. Um, so this is an example of one type of, of calculation. Um, other, other things, if I can get this to advance, there we go. Um, one of the groups here on campus is Klaus Schulten's research group. They do molecular dynamics on um, molecules uh, that are important for uh, cell walls and, and viruses and, and that sort of thing. Um, they've already used the early science system that was in operation this spring for Blue Waters. Um, they used that system to analyze the way a protein capsule encasing um, the HIV virus breaks apart. Um, so that a very interesting thing. Uh, and that was only on you know, roughly 15, 18% of blue waters um, at the time. They'll be able to do much larger problems um, once they get uh, the full size system. And remember that one quadrillion drops that fit into 20,000 swimming, po swimming pools? Um, if you're looking at doing chemistry on water, uh, you might, be, might have to do that at the atomic scale. Uh, if you look at a single drop of water, that 0.05 milliliters, um, do the appropriate chemistry calculations, for those of you that remember your chemistry, um, you'll come up that you still would have about 1.67 times 10 to the 21st water molecules in that drop. So that's still a very big number. So if you're trying to do a simulation of that, it takes a very big computer a very long time to do it accurately. So even to do one operation on each one of those water molecules, uh, it would still take a computer the size of Blue Waters over 40 hours just to make one operation. And one operation, of course, is not enough to do 
a simulation. You need many operations on each, each molecule to simulate what that single drop of water would do accurately. So that, that's the, the reason we build these very big computers to solve sometimes very small size problems that have very big importance to, to life on the planet. Um, moving beyond the planet, uh, some of our research teams look at uh, astrophysics. Uh, a group led by Brian O'Shea at Michigan State uh, will, will simulate the formation and evolution of small galaxies uh, formed shortly after the Big Bang. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with how, how fine grain can they make their grids and how accurately can they do their calculations. Um, with Blue Waters, they'll be able to do that much more accurately than ever before. And I guess it stopped rotating. Uh, well, it look, it's a little hard to see on the screen. Basically, those the spider webs there are, are the stars and the galaxies forming um, in, in the in open space there, with the, the dark areas being open space in between. All right. And we can move. So there are other projects that improve our understanding um, of, of nature around us. Some of these range from earthquake simulation, uh, the picture in the in the middle here is, is simulating earthquakes in, in Southern California from, by a team um, it, called the Southern California Earthquake Prediction Center. Um, there are others that do weather, a supernova, there's climate, subatomic physics, um, and much more. All of these groups are, are looking to use blue waters to increase their accuracy, incre increase the scale of their simulation, um, to, to apply it to problems on Earth and our understanding of physics understanding of biology, um, and so forth. And all that's made possible by a very large number of operations that we'll be able to do. So very big numbers and a very big impact. Um, and I think that is all that I have. All right. Thank you. So I believe we're open for questions. Any of you have any questions? Can you approach the microphones? What is it cost to rent time? To rent time? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know that number, but uh, I don't see actually our PSP partners in the room. Um, we do have a private sector partner program that uh, can can be used to purchase time on the system. Um, I'm sure Merle Giles or Evan Burness are around somewhere and can answer that question if you're really interested. Sure. So, so that would be for a, a company if they wanted, wanted to do that for um, proprietary research. The, the primary purpose of Blue Waters is, is not proprietary research. It's, it's government funded or open research. Um, so 80% of Blue Waters is, is um, funded by and, and will um, get to allocate the cycles via the National Science Foundation's allocation process to researchers around the country. And so the researchers have to submit a peer reviewed um, Proposal for time on the system. Uh, that's where the, the the groups that we meant that I mentioned during this talk, how they got allocated time on that system. Um, those groups all have to do um, open published research that will be shared with the general community. Um, companies actually are allowed to do that as well. So if a company wants to do research that they're willing to publish, they're they're well perfectly welcome to uh, submit for time via that allocation process as well, which will be provided at no charge um, directly to them. Other questions? Quiet bunch today. You were you use parallel computing in this, mm -hmm. right? What are the logistics of that as far as you here are concerned? So the question is we, we use parallel computing and what, what are the logistics here um, as how the, how we make use of that, I guess, is that roughly correct? So, so you're you're, you're quite correct. Um, Blue Waters um, is not one processor um, like the old days when you had a, a cray cray vector machine that you, you could basically run one one stream of operation through it. Um, today, we're, you were talking about a machine that has over twenty five thousand nodes, uh, individual individual operating system images. And so you have to be able to coordinate um, a, a calculation across all those nodes, or at least a significant fraction of those, simultaneously in order to make good use of that resource. Um, so to do that, there's a very high-speed interconnect between those nodes, but it's still much slower than the, than the um, operations that would take a, take a um, 
operate within the, within a single node. So you have to be careful how you use that those resources, just as you have to be careful with when you write to secondary storage and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's a bit like having 25,000 people in a room and hoping to get a job done 25,000 time, 25, times faster than if one person did that job. You have to have very careful coordination how you divide up that work in order to make good use of that resource. What's your difficult program? Parallel programming is a is a uh, challenge, as as I'm sure some of the parallel programmers in this room, there are a few here, will will attest to. There are there are significant challenges to m making effect, efficient use of that resource. Um, just in the like the people analogy I just used, um, it's not not easy to schedule and keep all those people busy all the time. Um, that's a very big challenge. How do you divide up the work and divide the data up in in a similar in a fashion that makes sense too? information is it visual showing a, a trend or, or what what do people get so, so that's a very good question the question is what do you get out of the machine what how do you take that output and make it understandable um, by the scientists and by the general public um, and that, that's a, a, a very good question that generally speaking uh, many of these big calculations the primary output is is a file of numbers. <laughs> um, and in order to make that understandable by humans, we do have to do post-processing, um, do visualizations of that data. Um, and it, that that's, tends to be somewhat domain-specific, of course. So uh, how you understand what a um, severe storm model is doing is a bit different than what you do to understand how um, a molecular modeling simulation is, is happening and what's happening inside of a virus. But the ideas are the same. You're taking that those numeric outputs. Um, you're applying uh, advanced visualization techniques. For example, the, the movie that, or the two couple movies that we've shown there um, of the hurricane and, and the uh, uh, galaxy formation, uh, the hurricane in particular, you saw some streamlines that were added in there. So help, help humans follow what the wind speeds are doing within that, that uh, vortex. A lot of times they don't make fancy movies to do the basic analysis. They do 2D cuts through and all kinds of different techniques to understand how that data um, is changing and how, how it's evolving over time. Um, and in, in, indeed, the analysis phase of these calculations is often a much more significant time challenge for the humans involved than is the actual calculation. Um, it, it, can be, it can take a long time to gain understanding out of the volume of data that would be produced in some cases. Good question. So uh, the research group will be doing the analysis or working with Blue Water staff members to help do the analysis. Um, and it depends on the research group and the volume of data that they produce as to whether it will be done, done on the system or will it be taken off and done at their home institutions. There will be some of both. Um, on the, some, some domains, um, such as the um, severe storm and, and climate prediction, some, things like that produce enormous volumes of data so big that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to move the data off the system to somewhere else. As well, we, we have 300 petabytes of storage. Um, basically, no one else in the country has 300 petabytes of storage. So you can't take that giant data set that gets generated on Blue Waters and easily transfer it home. So those folks absolutely have to do the data analysis on Blue Waters as well as the calculation. Um, so we have um, an advanced visualization team that as well as the data um, analysis team that will be uh, ready to help them do that data analysis on the system. Um, other teams, uh, the data that they generate out is um, much smaller and much more tractable to move off the system and analyze in their home institution. And in those cases, they probably will do so. Brett, I was going to just address a little bit of that broader question, if, if it's OK sure. if I take a minute. Um, part, part of the thing about the codes that were accepted as PRACs, as codes to run on this machine, is um, this isn't their first rodeo. Their, the, uh, the idea of parallel programming and lar very, very large scale computation of or thousands of threads is something that people have been working on for many years. So all of, pretty much all of the codes that run on this machine 
are codes that have run on significantly sized machines already. Now, we may be offering them 10 times or 20 times the amount of, of computational power that they're used to, but the, the, uh, the sorts of questions that you're asking, how do you analyze so much data that you can't possibly ever load it onto one hard drive, or those are all questions that these people spend time answering themselves, and so they've already got, they've already done it on a smaller machine, and so they have a general idea of how to do it. So um, doing it on Blue Waters, which is a larger machine than they're used to running on, they have to take the last step, and that may take some time, but they've already, they've already thought about the parallel processing. They've already thought about how do you take 20 terabytes and make it into something that I can put on a slide that make, actually makes sense to somebody. So we're working in partnership with those teams who have already have a lot of expertise in working on large parallel systems. So anyway, I don't know if that helps answer your question. I, I actually have a follow-up question on that. Um, of all the teams you're working with, are, how many do you think will be able to deploy code that can use the entire machine? And how many will just use some corner of it? I don't know, Greg, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> There are different demands for each application. So whether the application can scale to the full machine, there might be many that can, but whether they actually need to use the full machine, that's another question. How efficient are the codes at that scale? I would say that, you know, we, we, in fact, Craig and I were just talking with one science team this morning, and they have shown the capability to scale to just about any machine that they can run on to full scale. So. While it might seem like a daunting challenge, if if your parallelization of your application is done properly, um, it's 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 not unusual. So I would say out of the thirty plus applications that we have worked with so far, I would say that at least maybe mm, probably a quarter of them can probably utilize the full machine. So not every application, you know, there are algorithms that are inherently not scalable, and those limit those applications. But I would say that whether they're going to run at that level, uh, that's another story. But, so, but, you know, whether they can scale it to that far, they probably can, but it may not be efficient. That's the other thing to be concerned with. And the other angle is how much concentrated resource we can provide for that team. So an example would be the early science system, um, which was only about 18% of Blue Waters. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, maybe Bill or Greg remembers, um, but Klaus Schulten's team was very impressed with the amount of time they, they got on that system. It was only 18% of the size of Blue Waters. It was only available for about three months. Yet I think they said they got as much time on that machine as uh, they would getting on other systems in three Uh, Klaus's team shared the machine with, uh, in the end, 15 other science teams. In the beginning, six other, five other science teams. Uh, Klaus told me that his team got the equivalent of three years of computing that they have for all the other resources that they have access to. They have resources to about every large supercomputer. So they're subdivided by, um, uh, because many people use those other, other machines. So in that 13 weeks, he, even though he was sharing the machine, got the equivalent of three years of uh, computing resource that he normally would expect. One of his grad students told me that it accelerated his PhD by two years because he had scheduled out based on what he thought he was going to be able to get, and just in 13 weeks he was able to, to accelerate by two, two years. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, and different teams will use the resource differently. Some may use uh, some may use it all in one application, or most of the teams ask for more than the entire system because their science problems uh, can use that much computing or storage. It's a matter of do they use it all simultaneously, or do they use it over time? They use it for different different experiments or different thrusts of what they're doing. Klaus's team used the system for three different separate. Uh, research thrusts uh, that all made progress during that time period. You're in the back. So, 32. 
30, there are 32 teams currently allocated time in the system. Um, what was the other part of your question? What, are the, what, areas? Oh, what general areas? Well, I, we mentioned most of them here. I mean, it ranges anywhere from um, astrophysics, uh, cosmology, to uh, climate, weather modeling, uh, molecular dynamics, um, quantum, chem quantum chemistry, sorry, infectious, infectious disease spread. Um, what else? I'm sure there's some others I'm missing too, but it, it really spreads a large gamut of, of, of science areas. Um, not, not surprising, that's t typically how National Science Foundation wants to allocate things to a broad community. Um, there are some, some like the infectious disease um, example that are fairly non-traditional for large systems, uh, but others are, are much more common on large machines, you might say. So, hmm? um, Do you have some examples of um, research done that's going to be done here on Blue Water Spies, anyone in, at the University of Illinois coming up in the future, something that we can all watch in the newspaper for? So, um, depends on how you slice it, but uh, Klaus, Schulten team, Klaus Schulten's team is, is working on uh, a number of problems. Um, the one example there was with the HIV virus. Um, I believe they have some others. I'm not as tuned into exactly what problems they're, they're targeting, but looking at different aspects of cell walls and, and how cells behave. Um, And another example is how chlorophyll works to change light into energy. Um, there are others, uh, so Bob Wilhelmson's team, he's the lead PI for the uh, severe storm modeling um, team. Uh, that's partly based here, partly based at NCAR. Um, Don, Don Wubbles is high resolution climate, climate work. Um, am I forgetting anybody? Ah, Bill Gropp has a computer science related effort. Um, and I'm not sure I can tell you a lot more about his effort. I think it's more scaling of tools and scaling of, of libraries on the system to support um, the general community. OK. Um, yeah. <laughs> how efficient is the machine? What's the, what's the parallelization efficiency? So, so the question is, how efficient is the machine? And that, that's, a, that's a very hard question to, to answer in a general sense. Um, it really does depend on the, each application. You, you could talk about the efficiency of individual applications because um, it really depends on whether how what algorithms they're using, um, how much communication they, they need to, to do during that algorithm, um, whether they have to do um, I/O to secondary storage. All those you know, all those things will tend to reduce efficiency, and that's where the teams tend to put a lot of effort is optimizing that communication strategy within the system and optimizing that I.O. strategy if they have a, an I.O. problem um, to make sure that they can achieve good efficiency. One, one of the numbers, you, a couple different numbers you saw on, on the slides, um, our peak number is about 11 petaflops. Um, that, that's a very big number, um, but you might also note we, we also quote more generally one petaflop or one quadrillion operations per second. That's our sustained number. Um, and that's where we want an application using the full system um, to target being able to hit that sustained one petaflop. That, that's a very significant thing. There, aren't, um, there are other systems that have more than a, a petaflop of peak performance, uh, but getting that sustained performance above a petaflop is, is uh, still a very novel thing and a very important thing. Um, it's kind of like uh, the uh, urban myth that we only, humans only use a 10% of their brain. Uh, similarly, getting 10% really effective sustained utilization of, of a big parallel computer is, is, uh, is a, a big achievement as well. All right, I'm getting the time note here. Maybe one more question? No, this, this, this is a longer question. Um, it, it sounds like Sort of aim them at 10,000 or 20,000 clusters. It, it is very true. Some of those yeah. you duplicate, and some of those you don't. And then you do mm -hmm. intermediate calculations to sort of try to figure out where you want those. That, that's a 
that's a pretty good synopsis. When you, when you do a, a, have a petascale problem, um, again, it's very domain specific. Some have very large input sets and very large output sets. Others have a fairly small input set and a fairly small output set. But um, it really does, but you have to divide up both the calculations and the data that they're working on out to among those, all those individual nodes and individual processors. Um, and then during that calculation on, on a system of this scale, Usually, um, we're dealing with problems that have to do lots of intermediate results that have to exchange those results. And that's where you get into how do you do that parallel calculation efficiently? How do you exchange those results in a way that minimizes any overhead and, and minimizes the amount of time those processors are sitting there waiting for that data? Um, and that's, that is the crux of the challenge of parallel computing. That's how do you prevent stalls, basically. Not, not that uh, is universal or, or uh, um, really um, that I know of it today, anyway, no. All right, thank you.